And I close my eyes And I'm floating in the mind And I close my eyes And I'm drowning in the sky And I close my eyes Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to another episode of our series, Seerat Rasul, Lessons and Morals. I am your host, Yasir Qadi. In today's episode, we will discuss what exactly is the meaning of Seerah, and why should we study the Seerah, and what are the sources of the Seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. The word Seerah comes from the Arabic verb, Sara, which means to travel and to traverse. And so, Seerah is the journey or the traveling that a man does throughout his life. And so seerah means the journey or the path that a person takes, the manners, the characteristics, the incident that happened throughout his life. And Islamically, we only use the term seerah to describe the life of the Prophet wasallam. even though linguistically it can apply to any life. But Islamically, it has come to denote the life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So it discusses the life and times and incidents that are related to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if those incidents do not relate to him directly. So anything that relates to him even indirectly comes under the seerah. And so we all start talking about the seerah from the time before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though he had not yet been born. Yet the discussion of the seerah starts with incidents before his birth, such as the attack of the Kaaba by the elephants and the Abyssinian king. And it also discusses issues that were occurring during the life of the Prophet ﷺ, but still without his particular presence. For example, the situation in Yathrib before the immigration of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, the incidents that happened in Abyssinia when the Muslims emigrated there. The Prophet ﷺ never went to Abyssinia. And yet we will discuss what happened to the Muslims there because that too is a part of the seerah. Why study the seerah? What are the benefits and the blessings of studying the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The benefits and blessings of studying the seerah are many. First and foremost, it is an integral part of Islam to take the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the ultimate and only role model. In other words, we have been commanded to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all that he had done. So we take him as our role model in every facet of life, as a worshipper of Allah, how he used to worship Allah, as a leader, as a father figure, how he interacted with his wives and children, as a military ruler. In other words, we are commanded to take the Prophet ﷺ as a role model in all that he had done. As Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا you have in the example of the Prophet ﷺ, the perfect character to follow. And so, the only way to follow his example is to study his life. And that is the study of the seerah. Another blessing of studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is that this is the primary way to increase our love for the Prophet ﷺ. Look around you. You see that the people follow the lifestyles of those whom they love. There are many amongst mankind who look up to movie stars and actors and actresses. There are many amongst mankind who look up to sports players. And you find that every, each and every facet of their lives becomes news. And the people greedily follow every incident that occurs. Who met whom? Who fell down? Who broke an ankle and knee? Who won the match? Who lost a score? Who started a movie? Who did this and that? So much so that we even study their scandals and their evil things and the public devours them one after the other. Why? Because there is a love. Whether that love is valid or not is besides the point. There is an attachment. There is a role model that society has taken with these figures. The Muslim has a better role model. The Muslim has a perfect role model. And that role model is the Prophet wasallam. How will we love him? How will we demonstrate that love when we don't even know how he lived? We don't even know what happened in his life. Is it not a sad fact that most Muslims are more aware of the public figures in the media, of the actors and actresses, of the sports players, than they are of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the reality, and this is an indication of the state of the Ummah. To correct this state, to rectify it, we need to study the seerah. We need to study the life and times of this great and blessed man, the most blessed man whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala 
ever created. And by studying his life and times, we will increase in our love for him. Yet another blessing in studying the seerah is that we understand the context of the Qur'an better. The Qur'an came down, it was revealed in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Hence, by studying the seerah, we will automatically be attached to the Qur'an. You cannot read a book of seerah except that it has in it, this verse came down because of that, and this verse came down because of that. And so the context of revelation comes clear, and this increases our attachment to the book of Allah. Yet another blessing for studying the seerah of, is that the seerah, in and of itself, it is a miracle. Just the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ is a miracle. In other words, the very incidents that occurred in his life, the lifestyle that he lived, the way that he conducted his affairs, this in and of itself is an indication that this man was a messenger of God. He was a prophet of Allah. No human being could live such a lifestyle unless he truly, really and truly was a messenger of God. And so by studying the seerah, we appreciate the truthfulness of Islam. One of the blessings, one of the miracles of Islam is the Prophet of Allah. And the Prophet of Allah, we know about him through the seerah. One of the famous scholars of the past by the name of Ibn Hazm, he said, if the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not been given any miracles, if he hadn't been given the miracles that we know he had been given, the miracle of the Qur'an, the miracle of splitting the moon, the miracle of making a small amount of food a lot, the miracle of this and that, if he had not been given any miracles, the scholar said, the miracle of his life would have been enough. Just his lifestyle, his teachings, his, his, the way he conducted his affairs with other people of humanity, that would have been enough to prove that this man is a prophet of God. And this is another reason why we should study the seerah. Yet another blessing of the seerah is that the seerah lays out for us practical methodologies and guidelines for teaching, for instructing, for calling, for preaching. How do we call people to Islam? How do we invite them to this message? What do we do? How do we conduct our lives when it comes to the religion of Islam and spreading the teachings of Islam? The seerah tells us how to do this. How did the Prophet ﷺ interact with the non-Muslims? How did he invite them to Islam? By studying the seerah, we will help ourselves in spreading the message of Islam. Yet another blessing of studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is that the seerah brings us in touch with the companions of the Prophet. The people who lived around the Prophet and with the Prophet and along with the Prophet and alongside the Prophet ﷺ. The men who shaped history as we know it. By studying the seerah, we are automatically connected with them as well. And these two are role models, no doubt lesser role models than the Prophet ﷺ, but still, they are people whom we look up to. They are like guiding lights, they are like shining stars that we take for guidance, that we look up to for, for perseverance, to increase our morale and faith. And the seerah introduces us to all of these characters. Yet another blessing of studying the seerah is that the seerah brings about a peace and contentment in our hearts. It brings about a serenity by studying the seerah. And this is a fact and a reality that is known to all those who have read the books of the seerah. When we study the trials and tribulations that the Prophet ﷺ underwent, when we study the life and times, when we study the persecution that the early Muslims had to suffer, we feel a peace and serenity that yes, what is happening now happened before and even more so. And Islam eventually prevailed and it shall prevail now. We find a link, we find a commonality that just like Islam is being persecuted now, Muslims are being harassed wherever they are. Similarly, in early Islamic history were the Muslims persecuted. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ was ridiculed in his own lifetime. How did he react? What did he do? By studying the seerah, we will increase in our morale and our perseverance and our faith. And there are many other blessings of studying the seerah, one of them being that in our times, many people have nothing better to do than to attack the honor and reputation of our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They have nothing better to do than to draw denigrating and evil cartoons, ridiculing him. They have nothing better to do than to bad mouth and ridicule and sarcastically remark and label our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet of Mercy with the most vile and evil labels. And this is something that every Muslim detests and hates when other people do this. This is something that really and truly makes a Muslim very, very angry. 
The question is, what do we do in response? Do we go and commit senseless acts of violence as some people do? No, not at all. This is not what our religion calls for. This is not what our seerah calls for, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. What do we do? We respond with wisdom and eloquence. We respond with the sword of the pen and not the sword of guns. The sword of the pen is what we respond with and the sword of the tongue. We speak out and we write and we defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ. But how do we do so? We do so by studying the seerah and defending his honor. When people come and say, your Prophet, a'udhu billah, your Prophet was a tyrant and an evil ruler. Your Prophet was a dictator. Your Prophet was a terrorist, a'udhu billah. How are we going to defend the Prophet wasallam when we don't even know his seerah? So if you want to defend the honor of the Rasul, you must do so through a knowledge of the seerah, studying the seerah. When you study the seerah, then and only then can you defend the honor of the Prophet wasallam. We need to take a short break. We'll come right back and continue talking about the sources of the seerah. Stay with us. Welcome back. We were discussing the reasons for studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and realized that this science is a very, very old science in Islam. In fact, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, it is narrated that they would teach their children stories from the seerah just like they would teach them surahs from the Qur'an. They would ask them to memorize stories from the seerah, just like they would ask them to memorize surahs from the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an and the sunnah, these two are the ultimate sources of our religion. And the sunnah, of course, is the seerah. The sunnah meaning the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ, that is the biography. And so, from an early age, the companions would teach their children the Qur'an and the Sunnah. They would teach them surahs from the Qur'an and they would teach them stories from the seerah. Now, we are living 1,430 years roughly after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. The question arises, how do we know the seerah? Where do we get our information from? What is the sources of the biography of the Prophet ﷺ? Well, there are many sources, but to name just a few to simplify our talk. First and foremost, the most important source of seerah, and the most authentic source of seerah, and the most blessed source of seerah is the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an refers to a number of incidents that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an talks about the Battle of Badr, and the Battle of Uhud, and the Battle of Tabuk, and the Battle of Ahzab. The Qur'an talks about the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an talks about some of the things that happened in the childhood of the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an talks about even some of the pre-Islamic things that happened. For example, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the elephants that were meant to attack the Kaaba. Allah mentions this, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil feed. Do you not see how Allah took care of the people of the elephants? Who are the people of the elephants? They are a group of people who wanted to destroy the Kaaba before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah mentions it in the Qur'an and that's a source of seerah. So the Qur'an is the most blessed and the most authentic and the most authoritative source of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. The second source are the famous books of Hadith. The Sahih of Bukhari, the Sahih of Muslim, the famous Sunans and the famous Musnads. These are the classical books of Hadith. The Hadith is a statement of the Prophet ﷺ. And every statement is a portion of the seerah. The seerah is the whole life. And every hadith that we study is one bit, one snapshot, one utterance of the Prophet ﷺ. And sometimes we find an incident connected to that utterance. Sometimes we find because this happened, the Prophet ﷺ said that. Or due to such an incident that occurred, the Prophet ﷺ said that. And so we find the hadith attached to a story. And so the story becomes a part of the seerah. And of course every hadith in and of itself is also a part of the seerah because it is something that the Prophet ﷺ said. Another source of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ are the books specifically written for the seerah. There are many, many classical books that were written just to compile the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of these books, the earliest books ever written about the seerah, were compiled in the lifetime of the sons of the companions. Not the companions themselves. Generally, the companions themselves did not write down much. They wrote down only a few things. But they memorized a lot and they witnessed a lot. So their children 
they wrote down manuscripts and they wrote down bits and portions of the seerah and some of these bits and portions were then transcribed to later generations and they were absorbed by future generations until a man came along by the name of Muhammad ibn Ishaq Muhammad ibn Ishaq he was from Medina and he was born and raised in Medina and he lived his life amongst the sons and the grandsons of the companion and he decided to write a huge book about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so he wrote a very large and voluminous work which became known as the seerah of Ibn Ishaq because his name was Muhammad Ibn Ishaq and so it was called the seerah of Ibn Ishaq and he died in the year 150 Hijrah so 150 Hijrah very early on meaning he lived in the 90s, 100, 110 less than a hundred years after the Prophet he is a full adult man he is collecting information and he writes a huge book of seerah now this book was very very large and another scholar a generation after him by the name of Ibn Hisham came and he condensed it a little bit and that became known as Sirat Ibn Hisham it's the same book written by Ibn Ishaq but it was too large for the masses and so it was condensed into in our times usually Sirat Ibn Hisham is in four five six volumes so you can imagine Ibn Ishaq was much larger than this so Ibn Hisham came what did he do he cut out repetitive stories the same story in different versions he cut out the names of people 10, 20, 30 generations. Ibn Ishaq recorded generations after generations, the so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. Ibn Hisham came and he made it shorter, maybe four or five generations, and other simple modifications. He didn't add anything, and he didn't cut out anything important. He just summarized by cutting out that which was not that important. And this seerah became the most famous and the most classical book of seerah, Sirat Ibn Hisham and it has been translated into all of the major language of the world even in English there is a partial translation in Urdu in many of the famous and classical languages of the Muslim world of course in Arabic the original it is available in every famous bookstore Sirat Ibn Hisham you can see that the books written on Sirah were written very very early on in Islam very very classical in fact the books written on Sirah were the first books ever written in Islam before Bukhari and Muslim came along, books of Sirah had been written. Before any tafsir has been written, the books of Sirah has been written. And this shows us the care and the concern that the early generations of Islam took in preserving the Sirah of the Prophet ﷺ. There are other sources as well. Time only permits us to allude to some of them. For example, there is a specific group of books dedicated to talking about the lives of the companions many of the scholars compile the lives of the companions and so when you look at the lives of the companion you also find bits and pieces of the seerah the point being that whoever wishes to specialize in this science can indeed go back to the most classical and the most authoritative books of Islam however that is something that a scholar can do to go back to the original books in the original language meaning Arabic of course all of the original books are written in Arabic there is no other language in Islam that is sacred other than Arabic so all of these books have been written in Arabic. But throughout the centuries, many, many people have written books about the seerah. And one of the most famous books and the most accessible books, and the book that I recommend the most for beginning uh, students and beginning uh, Muslims who want to just study about the seerah, is a book entitled Ar-Rahiq Al-Makhtoum. Ar-Rahiq Al-Makhtoum. In English, it is called The Sealed Nectar. The Sealed Nectar by a very great and a very dear scholar a scholar whom Allah blessed me also to have the privilege and the luxury of studying under I had a very good relationship with him as well a great Indian scholar and his name was Sheikh Safiur Rahman Al Mubarak Furi he was from Mubarak Fur Sheikh Safiur Rahman Al Mubarak Furi and this great scholar of Islam who passed away only a few years ago he uh, wrote a book of seerah in the late 70s, early 80s, around 1979, 1980, he wrote this book. And there was a worldwide contest announced by an organization in Mecca. They said, we want to award a prize to the best book of Sirah written in our times. And so he wrote this book for this organization. And hundreds of people around the world wrote books for this uh, competition. And his book was chosen to be uh, the number one out of all of these hundreds of books, Sheikh Safi Rahman's books. And the reason is very obvious. When you see it, you will realize it. 
the language is simple, the uh, incidents have been narrated in much, much uh, graphical detail. He has compiled all of these classical sources and made it accessible. He has maps and diagrams. It is a very, very decent, interesting, simple book to understand. And it is a book that I recommend for all beginning people who want to study the seerah. This is the first book that they should read. In English, once again, it is called The Sealed Nectar. And in Arabic, it is called Ar rahiq Al-Makhtum. And also the title in other languages, in Urdu as well, it is the same, Ar rahiq Al-Makhtum by my dear Sheikh, Sheikh Safir Rahman Al-Mubarak Furi. Inshallah Ta'ala, in our next episode, we'll talk about the birth and the beginning life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before we get there, just to lay out what exactly was the political situation of the time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the Arabian Peninsula. He was born in the Arabian Peninsula in the 6th century after Jesus Christ. The 6th century CE. And at that time, there were two major political powers of the world. Two major political empires. One of them to the east of Arabia and one to the west of Arabia. The one that was for the west of Arabia was the Roman Empire. Or to be more precise, it was the Eastern uh, Byzantium Empire. The Roman Empire had split up into splinter empires. And so there was the Byzantium Empire. And to the east, there was the Persian Empire. Or to be more precise, the Sassanid kingdom, the kingdom of the Sassanids. So you had the Byzantines and you had the Sassanids. And in between, it was Arabia. And the Byzantines and Sassanids were superpowers. They were the mightiest powers. No other land, no other country had the might and power of these two lands. And these two lands and these two countries would be at continual war with one another. They would always be fighting. They would always be at odds. And in between them was Arabia. Arabia was dead center. To the west was Byzantium, and to the east was the Sassanid. Sassanid Empire now controls what is now called Iraq and Iran. And the Byzantines control what is now Turkey, and uh, parts of Palestine, and other areas of that, of that region, Egypt. All of this was under Byzantium control. Right smack in the middle is Arabia. And amazingly, Arabia was left untouched. Neither the Byzantines nor the Sassanids conquered Arabia. They didn't want to. They left it unconquered despite the fact the two countries were at war with one another. The reason being, and this shows us why was the Prophet ﷺ chosen to be of Arabia? What was so special about Arabia? Arabia was in between the two major superpowers of the time. And it did not have any history of colonialist or aggressive behavior. No, rather, because of the internal war warfare amongst the Arabs and their relative backward state, both of the two superpowers left Arabia alone. They didn't want to conquer Arabia because they saw no point in conquering this land. It was not a land that had any riches that they wanted. The people of Arabia were considered to be inter-fighting amongst themselves, warlike, Bedouin in their nature, so that neither the Byzantines nor the Sassanids wanted them. So Arabia was the perfect place for the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In our next episode, we will continue discussing the religious status of Arabia before the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I hope to see you then. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.